I got Yeah, I know. Okay, let's get started. So, uh, last day. So, hopefully, the lectures went well. I mean, the, the practical training sessions went well. We're all done that. We graduated. Congratulations. Uh, I, if I have time, I'll set up. A, I have a few pictures of some of the crystals you guys grew. I should tell you who I picked as a winner. Um, so we have three talks this morning. Uh, Ramesh Budani, who's from Morgan State uh, nearby, uh, he's here. And then he had a talk yesterday, so I can find Mac to talk. Second, and then Randy Dimas from uh, Quantum Design. We'll get the last talk, and then you guys have the keys to it after lunch. Okay, so hopefully, you brought your ID and all that stuff that you were reminded of several times. And uh, maybe Nick will receive a uh, <coughs> fewer bus will be outside here after lunch. We'll round you up. Okay, so uh. Ramesh, uh, uh, as I said, is nearby. He's an uh, expert in machine film growth. And he's going to talk to us about it. So I'll put him on this. Thank you very much. Well, can you hear me in the back? Yeah. Thanks, JP, for the intro. Uh, today is the last day of this winter school. And I hope you are not super saturated with the knowledge of 2D stuff. Because in the next hour or so, some more stuff is coming to work towards your way. And I hope there is still a little room left to, to absorb that. And uh, I'm going to talk about uh, thin film growth techniques for calcogenite materials. And the work I'm going to speak about today has been done mostly at the Department of Defense funded Center of Excellence on 2D materials at Morgan State University. This center was launched about one and a half years ago with funding from the Secretary of Defense's office. And we are partnering with uh, Johns Hopkins University Electrical Engineering Department, as well as the Applied Physics Lab of the Johns Hopkins. And we work very closely with the uh, Army Lab at Adelphi. So with that, let me quickly give you an outline of this talk. Uh, first, why thin films or 2D materials are important for our center. So I will talk about what is the constitution of this center, what is its mandate, and then I will give you an overview of various thin film deposition processes used for 2D materials. So that includes physical vapor deposition, chemical vapor deposition, solution growth, and so on and so forth. And my focus would be on sputter deposition, laser ablation, and CVD, chemical vapor deposition. Also particularly of this bismuth-based uh, uh, telluride like Bi2T3 
antimony telluride and tungsten diselenide. And finally, I will give you a brief summary with some key results. All right. So this is, these are the people who are contributing to the center, starting from the director at the top of the hour. Over here, these are my colleagues, four of them, starting Dr. Land, Birol, Alex, and Hirje at Morgan State. And then we have David and Rama from APL, and, Paul, uh, and uh, Paulette Clancy and Sujana Thon from Electrical Engineering, Guns Hopkins. And we work very closely with the uh, Army Research Lab, uh, particularly with uh, our uh, the Frank Gardia and Owen Bale at uh, Adelphi, right across the street here. Okay, so what is our primary mandate? The primary mandate of the center is to mentor and train students with the three very clear objectives to have skilled workforce for the DOD in the area of areas of critical materials, create champions of advanced research on electrophotonics, and hopefully these champions will one day serve the academic institutions, and create leaders for novel defense technologies. And we take students in three different ways. We have high school interns who come to our center, spend about six weeks in the summer, and then we encourage them to go to undergraduate school at Morgan State or at uh, Hopkins. And then some of, we also take undergraduates and graduates, and the goal finally is to serve the defense sector. Okay? All right. Now, the second objective is to develop cutting edge electrophotonic technologies for the Army using an emergent class of 2D materials. And we are focusing on uh, transition metal dicarbonized WX2, where basically tungsten sulfide, selenide, and tungsten telluride. All right. Why these three materials? I will tell you about that. So first, if you look at tungsten disulfide and tungsten diselenide, these two tend to stabilize in this hexagonal 2H phase, where the tungsten atom sits in this tetra trigonal prismatic coordination of the collagen. all right? If you look at WS2, tungsten disulfide, in the bulk, its band gap is about 1.35 electron volt. Band gap is indirect, but as you make them thinner and thinner, come down to two monolayer or so, the band gap increases to 2.05 electron volt, and it is also a direct band gap semiconductor at that point. Tungsten diselenide, in the bulk, the band gap is one electron volt, and for a monolayer or a bilayer is close to 1.7 electron volt, again, direct band gap. So the direct band gap of these ultra thin layers makes them very, very promising materials for photonics. And if you look at tungsten ditelluride, it prefers to, tungsten prefers to sit in the octahedral coordination of tellurium, and it has various polymorphs, the most stable one is this distorted octahedral T prime phase, which is also a wild summer metal. It has very exotic properties in transport. And it is particularly important for thermoelectric applications and as well as for spintronics because it has very large spin hall angle and it allows uh, efficient conversion of charge to spin or spin to charge. Now, so the second class of materials is these uh, bismuth telluride, antimony telluride, and their alloys. And again, this is also a layered compound, as you can see from the structure of the bismuth uh, Bi2Te3. These are the lattice points. Important thing to remember here is the melting point, very low, about 580 degrees Celsius. And it is a hexagonal structure. The primary unit is these five layers of tellurium, bismuth, tellurium, bismuth, tellurium, which is called a quint quintuplet. And if you stack them together, there is a van der Waals gap 
between two consecutive uh, uh, quintuplets, and that's what makes it a binaural compound, and you can feel it off layer by layer because the bonding there is extremely weak. Antimony telluride is also like that, same crystal structure, and actually very close lattice points, lattice parameters, so one can make very nice super lattice of antimony telluride and bismuth telluride. And antimony telluride is a p-type uh, material, thermoelectric material, and the melting points are very close. Yes. Um, on the previous slide, what stabilizes the, uh, the trigonal geometry as opposed to an oct octahedral geometry? It seems like you'd have bond angle strain. I, I don't know much about these materials. What is the question? What, so wh what stabilizes the trigonal prismatic geometry? Because it looks like you'd have, you'd have like relative to the octahedral geometry. Well, it has something to do with the atomic size, all right? So the tetragonal, this uh, trigonal prismatic is because selenium and sulfur are smaller in size compared to tellurium. Tellurium is much bigger. Okay. So now if you look at, this is a very interesting result. And this gives you a spin to charge conversion efficiency of this material, bismuth telluride at this end, antimony telluride at this end. And if you start with bismuth telluride, uh, you can see that the, the, the Fermi energy sits in the conduction band. It's pretty high conversion efficiency of 0.4. It keeps going. And then when the Fermi level comes right at the Dirac point, it goes to down to zero. And again, it picks up when you, when you put more and more antimony. So this is very interesting material as far as spin to charge conversion uh, devices are concerned, like in spintronics. OK. so. What we are doing here is the first area of research is basically to create spintronic electromagnetic radiation emitters, mostly terahertz emitters, and also microwave detectors. I'm giving you an overview of the kind of experiments we are doing. So here is a ferromagnet. The ferromagnet in, the, in our case is iron cobalt alloy. And for this particular composition, iron 85 cobalt 15, it is the softest ferromagnet that you have available with very large magnetization, close to about 2.1 Tesla. Okay, it's a very interesting material from that point of view. And one can grow it epitaxially on magnesium oxide substrate, for example. So we grow this epitaxially, and then on top of that, we put this metalluride. So this is the structure. And now you come from this side, from the left-hand side, and zap it with a femtosecond pulse of visible light coming from a tri-sapphire laser. And that laser light produces a non-equilibrium density of charge current, or sorry, spin current, which crosses the interface. And then because of the spin to charge conversion properties of this material, you get a, a pulse of charge current. And that charge current, when relaxes, produces terahertz radiation. So you have visible light coming from this side, and your output is terahertz. And these experiments we are doing in collaboration with uh, uh, Peter Amitaj at GHU and with uh, our Benjamin Jingleface at University of Delaware. So we have some published work in this area, okay? The second part of the experiment is, instead of using visible light, we excite the ferromagnet with microwaves. So we do a ferromagnetic resonance experiment. And so when you excite this with microwaves, the magnetization undergoes precession, and that precessing magnetization forms a spin current into the topological insulator. And again, that spin current converts into a charge current. And in this open circuit condition, you actually get a DC voltage across the device. So this is what is called the inverse spin hall effect. And we measure that. And that way, we calculate the spin to charge conversion efficiency of this material. And all these experiments are done down to 1.6 K in this cryostat we have set up very recently. And we have a long waveguide, sorry, the, the sample stage, which carries microwaves down to this coplanar waveguide. And then you put your sample right here, attach two leads to it, and measure the DC voltage as the magnetization undergoes precession at a particular frequency, resonance frequency. The second experiment that we are doing is uh, looking at quantum defects and we are trying to interrogate these defects with electromagnetic radiation. So this experiment, if you remember, 
uh, the monolayer and two layers of molybdenum disulfide, tungsten disulfide, and selenides give you a very strong photoluminescence. For tungsten diselenide, the photoluminescence peaks at about 70, 770 uh, nanometer or so, you see here, and this is for tungsten disulfide. It turns out that this is the result at room temperature, but it turns out that if you cool it down, and if you have certain type of defects in, this, in, the, in your material, this PL peak actually splits into, you have a broad PL peak, and then you get a very sharp line, which is basically single photon emission. So it's a quantum character of that transition, you get single photon emission, okay? And so, and, and this is result taken from this paper here. So they have produced defects by straining the WSC2 film at these locations, and you see a very bright emission from here, and that corresponds to this sharp line. So we are trying to do these experiments, and we also want to interrogate this by doing something called optically detected ferromagnetic resonance. What you do is you apply a microwave field while doing this experiment, and you also apply a DC magnetic field. So when you apply a DC magnetic field, you can Zeeman split the energy levels. And then the, depending on how much splitting you have, with the microwave radiation, you can excite the electrons and put in, in, in different Zeeman states. And that way, either you can either suppress the photoluminescence or you can enhance it. So these are, these are the kind of experiments we are trying to do. And the third experiment is making wearable quantum dot solar cells. And this work is being done at Hopkins by Susanna and her team. Uh, so the structure is basic, basically here. You have an ITO coated glass substrate. So ITO is the conducting substrate, transparent conductor. And then you put an electron transport layer, which is shown in green here, which is zinc oxide. And then you have quantum dots here, uh, basically cadmium sulfide, cadmium selenide, or lead selenide. And then you need a whole transport layer, which is WSE2. That's where the 2D material becomes important. So now when you shine light, what happens is these quantum dots produce electron hole pairs. And then you have to create a proper potential so that electrons and holes can be separated from each other, okay? So the role of WSE2 is to pull the holes this way and the electron transport layer pulls the electron down and then you have a current in the circuit. So the challenge now is how to deposit WSC2 on top of the quantum dots, because quantum dots are very delicate. They cannot take high temperature. So depositing WSC2, which requires four to 500 degrees C temperature, is a challenge. So what we are doing is now we are making inverted solar cells. So we'll put WSC2 down, put quantum dots and the electron transport layer on the top. So that's one experiment. And the second experiment is uh, uh, making phototransistors and photodetectors. And this work is being done by David and his team at Applied Physics Lab. And what they are trying to do is they are putting plasmonic nanostructures on top of the 2D material. And what the plasmonic nanostructures do, because when you are dealing with WSC2, it's only two or three monolayers thick. And when you come with light, it cannot absorb most of the light because it's too thin. So you want to couple, you want to make sure that your material absorbs more light. So for that, you make these plasmonic nanostructures. So that's how you can couple more electromagnetic field to your sample. So this experiment, these experiments are also going on. And lastly, this is uh, trying to make thermoelectricity using thermoelectricity thermoelectricity for noise-free refrigeration and detector cooling. This is a very important project for the defense sector because they want thermoelectric coolers which will work in the temperature range of minus 50 to minus 150 degrees Celsius. And these are needed for cooling infrared focal plane array detectors in a battlefield condition. And also such detectors are also used for cooling robotics and satellite systems and so on and so forth. So it's a very important project to make 
thermoelectric devices which will work at lower temperature. Above room temperature, no problem. You have all kinds of materials. But below, down, down to about minus 150 degrees Celsius is a challenge. So we are trying to investigate some of these 2D materials for low temperature thermoelectric applications. So the first step in that direction is to make the material and then to characterize it for its thermoelectric properties. So this is a very simple structure that we have made. This is a PPMS, PUC, Physical Property Measurement System, which you must have seen in the physics department here. And we make this platform. So we put our sample this way. One end is hot, other end is cold. And once you create a temperature gradient across this, you have a charge current flowing, depending on the type of charge carriers going from hot end to the cold end. And you develop a voltage across this, and you can measure that, and you can convert that into your civic coefficient or thermoelectric, okay? And it turns out that for making large scale devices, you actually need a fairly thick <coughs> tungsten ditelluride film, so this technique is being developed at Applied Physics Laboratory. What they are doing is they take silicon vapor and then they coat a slurry of tungsten ditelluride ink on top of this. And then again, put a graphite foil and this process called spark plasma sintering. So you go to very high temperatures. In a minute or so, you can crystallize the material, make a fairly thick WTE2 film. Okay. So with that, now let's talk about various thin film deposition techniques that are available to us today. So you have physical vapor deposition and physical vapor deposition, you are producing the two materials which are going to make your compound in the vapor phase, all right? By, by evaporation or by electron beam. beam so the, the, the PVD process has these four different variants. First is your molecular beam epitaxy. Then you have sputtering and sputtering also has different forms. You can have DC sputtering, you can have ion beam sputtering, or you can have RF or pulse DC sputtering, depending on the nature of target that you are trying to sputter. Pulse laser ablation, you can do using an eczema laser, which is the best way of making films with PLD but you can also use neodymium YAG solid state laser, third or fourth harmonic of the fundamental wavelength, which is 1064. So third harmonic will come in the UV about 355 nanometer or so. So you can use that. Thermal evaporation, of course, you can either simply use electron beam evaporation or simple thermal evaporation to create these films. Chemical vapor deposition has two variants. First is called the powder CVD. It means you take, you do calcogenization of transition metal film, which is tungsten in our case, or tungsten oxide film, and react it with the vapor of the calcogen, which is sulfur, selenium, or tellurium. all right? So you are taking at least one component in the powder form, and that is you take sulfur powder or selenium powder or tellurium powder. The second form is the called metal organic chemical vapor deposition, MOCVD, where you take volatile metal organic compounds of the transition metal and calcogen. So some examples here are, for molybdenum, you have molybdenum hexacarbonate, tungsten hexacarbonate, and for sulfur, you have H2S gas, or H2SE gas for selenium, or you can use diethyl selenium for this particular compound for sulfur. So you have various possibilities. The only thing is MOCVD, it is, it is very, one has to be extremely careful with the compounds you are dealing with. Some of them are extremely toxic. So safety is a, is a major concern as far as MOCVD is concerned, uh, is concerned, okay? And finally, you have wet processes for deposition. You can do mechanical exfoliation of the bulk tungsten disulfide or selenide, produce an ink, and then simply spin coat that ink and make a device, okay? That is also done in many cases, particularly in the area of solar cells. People do this spin coating a lot. 
Now, before I go to each of these techniques, I would like you to pay some attention to the, these physical properties of the starting materials, okay? So, for example, if you want to make molybdenum disulfide, selenide here, so look at the vapor pressure of molybdenum. One pascal of vapor pressure, you require a temperature of 2400 degrees Celsius for molybdenum. Now, if you are trying to make molybdenum diselenide, look at the temperature required to produce one pascal pressure of selenium is only 216 degrees Celsius. So there is a huge difference between the partial pressures of the refractory metal and the chalcogen. And that makes it serious, gives us a lot of trouble in making a stable compound. Same way for tungsten, you see, very high temperature is required to produce one pascal of pressure whereas selenium is very small. So it is really challenging to make these two materials, to make stoichiometric compounds, molybdenum disulfide, molybdenum ditelluride, and so on and so forth. Life is a little simpler when you take bismuth telluride and antimony telluride, because first of all, the melting points of these two materials are low. And you look at the vapor pressure of tellurium, it's 240, and antimony is this much, this much, they are all really in the same ballpark. So now when you want to grow epitaxial film, a rule of the thumb is your deposition temperature should be at least two thirds the melting temperature of the material, okay? So now two third criteria, you look at bismuth telluride, you need about 200 degrees C to grow a good epitaxial thin film of bismuth telluride, all right? That's very easy to do. On the other hand, for this year, the melting points are 1200 degrees C here. So you need about seven to 800 degrees C temperature to grow tungsten ditelluride. And at 700 degrees C, you put your substrate at 700 degrees C, the tellurium refuses to stick because it's at very high vapor pressure. It's simply pumped out of the system. So that's the main challenge in making these ditelluride, disulfide, and disulfide, okay? Okay, so what happens in molecular beam epitaxy? Now it's a quite, uh, it's a nice way of producing epitaxial thin films, but it's very expensive, difficult to maintain. You need an army of graduate students to run this facility. So I stay away from MBE. I'll talk about sputtering to you a little bit later. But basically what you have, is you have these sources, which are effusion cells or neutron cells where you evaporate sulfur or tellurium and so on and so forth. For refractive metals, tungsten and molybdenum, you cannot use an effusion cell because the melting temperature is very high. So you need electron beam evaporation, okay? And then you are, this is your substrate. You can precisely monitor the flux of atoms coming from these sources using this beam flux monitor. That's the beauty of MBE. So you can precisely control how many atoms you are putting on your substrate. And at the same time, you can monitor the growth on the substrate by using something called reflection, high energy electron diffraction. So you have an electron beam coming at the glancing angle. It diffracts from the surface and you put it on the, look it on the screen here. So it tells you how the epitaxy is progressing by simply monitoring the read pattern on the screen. You can also put many other gadgets. You can put OJ, you can put a quadrupole mass spectrometer and make it really very, very expensive process. The whole thing is jacket is cooled with liquid nitrogen. So you achieve a, a base pressure of something like 10 raised to the power minus 11 to 10 raised to the power minus 12 to. That's why it becomes so difficult to maintain this machine. Okay. Now, as far as the epitaxial growth is concerned, since these are hexagonal crystals and you want to grow, so if you use a 3D substrate, which is like silicon or strontium titrate or magnesium oxide, so one, one, one plane will give you hexagonal symmetry, okay? You can work out the lattice parameters and see whether it fits with the lattice parameter of the material you are trying to deposit or not. But it turns out that sapphire, one, one, the C plane sapphire, zero, 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 one sapphire, Although the lattice mismatch between 001 sapphire and WSE2 is huge, about, about 25%. But it turns out that you can still grow WSE2 epitaxially on sapphire. And that happens because 
something called commensurate superstructures are formed. That means when the lattice parameter of the material you are trying to deposit is an integral multiple of the lattice parameter of the substrate, you can have a superstructure. Okay. That happens in the case of WSE2 and Savage. Okay, so now let's talk about sputter deposition. Here, in situ growth of well crystallized WSE2 and WTE2 by sputtering is a very challenging task. We have burned our fingers, spent a lot of time, we did not succeed. Okay, the reason is you need very high growth temperature above 600 degrees C, and at that temperature, the tellurium, sulfur, and selenium refuses to stick to the substrate. So you get a film which is highly deficient in carbon okay. We tried, as I told you before, we tried various combinations. So we used a, a tellurium target to give extra tellurium. And we use a target of WTE2. WTE2 is metallic, so you can use DC sputtering. Whereas for tellurium, you have to use RF, radio frequency. So you sputter these two. We sputter tellurium at least 10 times more supply of tellurium compared to the supply of WTE2, substrate it at about 600 degrees C, and still you have a tellurium deficient film. Okay. And you can see from here, if you measure the carrier concentration of these films at various temperatures, you can see that the carrier concentration is very high, 10 to the power 22 carriers per centimeter cube. A good, good quality bismuth telluride should not have more than 10 to the power 19 carriers per centimeter. So this extra carriers are coming because you have a lot of tellurium vacancy. You are literally looking at almost like a tungsten film. Okay, so we gave up this. But there are people who have made good use of sputtering to make device quality WSE2. And this is a paper from Air Force Research Lab. You can see this details of this in this review article uh, by the group of uh, Nicola Glavin and others. And what they do is they use DC pulse sputtering to to sputter a WSE2, W tungsten sulfide target, WS2 and WSE2. So you need to use DC pulse sputtering because these targets are insulating in character. You cannot use plain DC sputtering because the target acquires a lot of charge. So to dissipate the charge, you have to pulse the power. And at the same time, you put an AC modulation on the voltage. So that way you get rid of the charge build up on the top. Okay, it's a very powerful process it's called pulse DC sputtering. And what they do is they deposit these films at room temperature on PDMS, polymer substrate. Okay. And after doing that, what they do is they use, they use something called photonic annealing. So they use a green laser. And with the green laser, they draw lines on the PDMS WSC2 or WS2 films like that. The beauty is when you are using green laser, the substrate does not absorb that laser light. Okay? And if the power is sufficiently high, you can locally crystallize WSC2 or WT2. Okay? And once it is crystallized, you have a good high quality semiconductor and you can image this, these lines actually by looking at the Raman lines of WSC2. So they have made all kinds of various kinds of devices and this technique also allows you to make heterostructures. So you deposit, suppose you want to create a heterostructure of WSE2 and uh, molybdenum tungsten disulfide, molybdenum disulfide, you deposit one layer of tungsten disulfide at room temperature, amorphous layer, put second layer of tungsten diselenide, and then go for this photon annealing so you have a super lattice created in situ. So very, very powerful technique. All right, we have made a, a high quality bismuth telluride films by sputtering. As I said, there is no problem in making 
bismuth telluride and bismuth antimony telluride because of their low melting point, okay, and comparable vapor pressure. So we do that, and we get, as you can see here, uh, a carrier concentration of roughly about 18 to 10 is about 20. It is still a little higher than uh, the bulk MB grown films. But the beauty is, if you look at the transport properties of these films, you actually see this anomalous um, magnitude resistance or the anomalous backscattering of charge carriers when you do transport. For example, if you look at the rho x, x is the longitudinal resistivity, and you vary the angle between the applied magnetic field and the direction of current, you are rotating the magnetic field in the plane of the film going from zero to 360 degree, and you see that your rho x, x follows this kind of angular dependence. So you can see that at maximum at uh, zero and 180 degree and minimum at 90 degree, okay? And this is a signature of, now this type of anomalous magnitude resistance is actually seen in magnetic thin films like permalloy, iron cobalt, and so on and so forth. It happens because of the SD scattering of electrons. And the question now is why are we seeing this anomalous transport in a material which is actually not magnetic? It has something to do with its topological character. Okay, so that's uh, we see that both in, in longitudinal resistivity, so measure this way, or you measure the in plane hall resistivity, take voltage, measure voltage between this and this point and rotate the magnetic field in the plane of the film. So you get sine phi cosine phi dependence in peaks at 45 degrees. And for the sake of comparison, the value of an isotropic magnetic resistance for bismuth telluride about 0.05%, okay? And it is good to compare it with the ferromagnet. So if you look at the permalloy, it is about 2%. Iron gallium boron is 0.4%. So the AMR is small, but it is there, and it is comparable to what people have reported in MB grown films. Yes, please. When you sweep field in plane like that, don't you expect some sort of cosine behavior just because of like current jetting effects and things? How do you differentiate between that and this? No, I'm not getting your point. What I'm saying. When you sweep your magnetic field in plane with current, don't you normally get some, in rho xx, don't you normally get some sort of sign behavior just because of differences when you're applying field with the current versus parallel or perpendicular to the current? Or it can be orbital. Yeah. Or what you use? No, this is, this is not out of plane. The magnetic yeah. field stays in the plane of the film. Okay? Yeah. If you do this out of plane, you will get an orbital magnetic resistance and in plane magnetic resistance. That will give you a dependence. Then you may also pick up some Hall signal from there. But not here. You have to, if you are able to precisely align your sample and the magnetic field stays in the plane of the sample when you are rotating it 360 degree, this is what you get is the anisotropic magnetic resistance. Okay. If your sample is slightly tilted with respect to field, although you may think that it is perfectly parallel, you will get some artifacts. So you have to be very careful when you are doing this experiment. Okay. Now, we have also done spin pumping in this experiment. So I showed you the low temperature system. So this sample here is uh, bismuth telluride deposited on top of iron cobalt barom boron, which is a soft ferromagnet, amorphous. And so what we do, we take this bilayer and put it on top of a coplanar waveguide in a flip chip geometry, all right? You see here, the sample is facing down on the waveguide. And then you can do a ferromagnetic resonance experiment. So you get this nice resonance peak. And depending on what frequency you are using, the resonance field changes. So that's the standard ferromagnetic resonance experiment, nothing exciting about it. But important part is the inverse spin hall effect. When you measure the voltage across this from here to here, while you are exciting it with microwaves, you start getting this DC signal, okay? And there has been a lot of controversy in the literature. People say that, well, you can get this DC signal even from a plain ferromagnetic field. So how do you, 
rule out or how do you separate out the contribution of bismuth telluride that you have put on top of this? How do you separate out the contribution of spin hall effect? So for that, we did a very clever experiment. What we do is we measure this first facing down, then we measure it again facing up. If it is a simple effect of the ferromagnet in both the cases, the signal should have the same sign. But if it is the contribution of spin injection or spin hall effect, then when you flip the sample, the polarity of the signal should change. And that's what we have done here. So up, facing up, facing down, and finally, this is the true spin hall signal that comes out of this interface. Okay, so now let's talk about pulse laser ablation. I'm running out of time. Five minutes. Five minutes? Okay. Oh, sorry. Okay, so quickly let's talk about PLD because uh, uh, here um, UMD has been a pioneer in the area of pulse laser ablation for many, many years. So many of you must have seen this system in the lab physics department. And basically what you have, you have a laser beam coming from an XML laser. You put your target here and the laser beam hits the target. The energy density locally is very high and the target simply melts and ablates, okay? And you get a plume, and that plume is deposited on the substrate. That's a simple pulse laser deposition, all right? But you have to take care of many, many things in order to get a good film. And what are those factors? First of all, you have to, uh, you need a critical energy density for ablation. Now, when you are ablating a metal target like tungsten, the energy density required is enormous. You need about 12 to 15 joule per centimeter square. If you use the same energy on your tungsten diselenide target, your target will disappear, okay? So you have to, for that, you need very low energy density, about 0.5 joule per centimeter square. So you have to tune that properly. You also have to worry about this distance because this distance decide how many particles you are getting in your film. This is, a, this is a problem with PLD. Most of the time, the film is contaminated with this particulate matter, which comes from the target. And there are tricks. It's more of an art than science, how to suppress the, uh, the, the particulate density in your film. So you have to play with the distance between the target and the substrate. You have to, you have to play with the gas pressure in the chamber, and you can eventually grow a reasonably good film. Again, you have to optimize the growth temperature for epitaxy. You can do in situ monitoring with read, reflection, high energy electron deflection. And the beauty of PLD is it provides, it gives you an excellent control over the thickness of the film. Why? Because when you, you can, you can count the number of shots that you are firing on your target. One shot will give you a fraction of an angstrom film. So depending on how many shots you are firing, you can precisely control how thick a film you are, you, you are depositing, okay? And uh, all right, so it also gives you great flexibility for growth of heterostructures. Now we have deposited WSC2 films using PLD. This is some of our recent results. So you see at the top one, this is plain sapphire substrate, and then you have uh, two layers of WSC2, four, six, and bulk. And you can see the characteristic Raman peak coming from this. And the thicker film also gives rise to, or yields a very large photoconductivity. And we can do a photoconductivity experiment in this chamber geometry. You come with a laser, shine laser light here, expose it. So when you expose it, you have photocurrent going through the sample. So, if the sample show is showing good photoconductivity, that means you have a good crystal in your hand, okay? Now, the same technique has been used by this group from, uh, reported from China, and they have deposited WSC2 on a polymer substrate. And then on top of that, they deposit ITO, the conducting electrodes, and they have done photoconductivity measurements. What they do is after depositing the, the film, they curve it like this. And they want to see how much curvature this can tolerate. And it turns out that this R here is 10 millimeters, 7 millimeter, 5 millimeter, 
there is no change in the photoconductivity response. So you have a nice flexible photoconductor in your hand using this process. Okay, I'll skip this. We have made uh, first laser deposition of tungsten ditelluride, very high quality films. And we have also measured uh, thermoelectric power down to about uh, 5 Kelvin. And we have also measured the thermoelectric power as a function of magnetic field up to 9 Tesla. So these results are we are in the process of publishing right now. So let's skip that. Uh, okay, we also measured the thermoelectric response of these devices. So you have bismuth telluride film here, antimony telluride here, antimony telluride is a P type thermoelectric, bismuth telluride is N type. You create a junction here and you heat the junction with a variable power infrared laser. You can measure the temperature difference using a copper constant and thermocouple in the differential geometry. And this is the output of the thermocouple you can see. So we are creating a temperature gradient of somewhere around 0 to 1.2 degrees Celsius. And then corresponding voltage between the core, these two terminals is shown here. So we get an average thermoelectric power of 14 microvolt per K, which is, which is pretty good, okay? Now let's talk about chemical vapor deposition because I like this technique. It, it, it works beautifully and you, it's easy to set up in your lab. So first I will talk about powder CVD, where we are doing calcogenization of a transition metal film or a film of transition metal oxide in the vapors of the calcogen, which could be sulfur, selenium, or tellurium. And the way it works is shown here. So you have a two zone, two furnace. In one crucible, you put molybdenum oxide or tungsten chloride. These are the source for the transition metal. This is sulfur, selenium, or tellurium. You heat these two zones at right temperature. You create the vapors of both these, <coughs> and you transport the vapors down, put your substrate here. If the conditions are right, you will get a film. And that's the reason why it's called powder CVD, because you are starting with powder of sulfur and powder of molybdenum trioxide. Okay? You can improve on this. Instead of using powder of molybdenum trioxide, you can make a thin film of molybdenum trioxide by simply thermal evaporation, or you can make a thin film of pure metal like molybdenum or tungsten by, excuse me, by sputtering, okay? So the advantage is here is, excuse me. So, what are here? Okay, so, so what is the advantage here? It's a simple low cost approach, excellent control over thickness. Why? Because it's in your hand how thick a tungsten film you want. You can sputter deposit a thermos, uh, tungsten film down to one nanometer thick, even fraction of a nanometer. It needs a little bit of trick, but we have been able to do to deposit tungsten film down to 0.3 nanometer. And then you, this way it allows you to deposit very smooth films and you can also do doping. How? When you are sputter depositing your tungsten, you co-sputter your dopant. So your dopant atoms are already in your tungsten film. And then you put it in your CBD reactor and simply convert it into the material, okay? And now, what is metal organic CVD? Metal organic CVD is, you have the source of sulfur or selenium is the gas, H2S or H2SE. And for molybdenum or tungsten, you have this molybdenum hexacarbonate, which has a very low melting point. So you can make a simple bubbler, bubble the carrier gas through, you carry this compound into the reactor, okay? And you carry your sulfur selenium also into the reactor. And this is so-called a cold wall CVD. The walls are water cooled because you don't want any deposition on the walls of the reactor. So you have a platform here, which is made of graphite. You heat it with microwaves. 
And when this becomes very hot, you can monitor the temperature with the thermocouple. You put your substrate here, both the gases come down, and you get your film. Now, you can work out the gas dynamics in the reactor. It's very important to, to, to work on that a little bit. You want a laminar flow. You don't want any turbulence in the reactor. OK? So by optimizing the flow conditions and the design of the reactor, you get very high quality films. So it's a very clean industrial process. In fact, most of the gallium nitride uh, devices that you see are made using MOCVD. Uh, you have control, uh, controlled growth over large areas, excellent process control. Uh, you can put extra flow channels to incorporate dopants, no contamination of reactor walls. Only thing is you need to follow stringent safety protocols because the gases are very toxic, okay? And also, it is an expensive process to set. All right? Yeah. At the previous slide, uh, what about there? Do you not get deposition all over the chamber? How do you control the deposition to be on the substrate? I mean, uh, uh, you see, what happens is you have sulfur coming here, right? Sulfur, selenium, or tellurium coming from this source. Now, if your reactor wall is very hot, it's not going to stick. Because it's too hot. It's too hot. That's why you need a hot wall CVD in this process. So it is going to react only with your film here. And it will not stick to the walls. It will stick downstream where the tube becomes cold. So it's a, it's a pretty messy thing. You have to clean it up periodically. But as far as the reaction zone is concerned, the walls of the reactor are absolutely clean. Okay, so now some of our results here. So we do tungsten dyes. Uh, we have, sorry, we evaporate. Uh, we have used two different approaches. We have used tungsten oxide as a source. We deposit it on silicon vapors and put it in the reactor and get our WSC2 films. Films come out very nice, as you can see from the Raman spectra here. So this is down to about two nanometer thick film. And, uh, we have measured photoconductivity of these samples. It's a very simple setup, which has been developed in the lab. So you have these, uh, this, is the, this is WSC2 deposited on silicon dioxide substrate, and you have these uh, electrodes. And uh, you simply bias it, and you shine laser here, and you depending on, so you can see here, when you shine the laser for a particular value of the bias voltage, you get this response, okay? Very sharp photoconductivity. And you may say that, well, it could be because of sample heating, because of the heat, right? So you have to be able to separate out the thermal contribution from the, origin, from the real electronic contrib contribution. Electronic contribution is happening because you are exciting carriers from the conduction band, valence band, and putting them in the conduction band. That's what increases the conductivity, okay? The second thing is if you, you are heating the sample, you are dealing with a semiconductor. When it becomes hot, the resistance drops. So you should be able to separate out those conditions and you can do an analysis of the rise time. And it turns out that the signal is mostly electronic. Okay. Okay, same process has been used now to make a WSC2 starting with tungsten films, not tungsten trioxide. And we like this process because this gives us very, very good control. We have a clean USB sputtering system. We sputter tungsten. We can also sputter dopants. We make that on SiO2 or sapphire vapor, then put it in the CVD reactor. So you have selenium here. This is your tungsten film. Your carrier gas, argon, hydrogen comes down. And if the conditions are right, you get a very nice uniform film. And I will show the results. This is our 0.5 nanometer tungsten film. Uniform tungsten diselenide. You see nice Raman peak. You see very clear photoluminescence. Okay. And now we are in the process of measuring this down to low temperatures and see if there is any quantum character. And we'll also then transfer these films on a substrate which will provide local strain fields and then try to see uh, quantum emission. 
All right, so I can stop now, actually. We have, this is a pure wet process where people have used, we have also tried it. You make an ink of sodium tungsten, this compound here, which has, the source is tungsten here. This is the source of selenium. These two salts are soluble in water. So you make an ink of these two salts, all right? And then you can spin coat it on your silicon vapor. Once it is spin coated, you simply put it in your CVD reactor, put a little bit of extra selenium, just in case you have less selenium in your ink, and eventually you get a film. You get patches actually, you don't get uniform coverage, so you can see these. And look at this point here, B point, gives you a very nice Raman peak. So this is actually a monolayer of WHC2, and again, very strong photoluminescence. It's a, it's a little messy process. You have to deal with all kinds of liquids, salts, spin coated, and it turns out that you don't get a uniform film. You get always patches. So our preference is for sputtering a PVD physical vapor process with deposit tungsten down to about 0.3 nanometer and convert it into sulfide or selenide. Okay, so I can summarize. So PLD and powdered CVD are two powerful techniques to deposit high quality films of WSA2 and tungsten disulfide over large area as low cost. In a small lab, you can set it up easily. And, uh, uh, but powder CVD has some limitations when it comes to growing heterostructure, okay? And sputter deposition at temperatures less than 200 degrees Celsius works beautifully for the growth of highly textured device quality tungsten ditelluride and tungsten diselenide. Sputter deposition is also ideal for growth of micro interfaces with other materials such as ferro and antiferromagnetic alloys for studies of spin transport. So with that, I would like to thank uh, the Office of the Secretary of Defense and the Department of Defense for funding us. And thanks to all our collaborators from Morgan, Johns Hopkins, and ABL. With that, thank you very much. Yeah. Hey. Yes, please. Uh, sub one nanometer film you were just showing there is like a week ago. Which one? Uh, the one from depositing tungsten and then uh, so not, yes, this. This one, you can over patches of about 50 microns, you get a uniform. Yeah. The trick in is in growing tungsten uniform. So if you sputter tungsten at fairly at high rate, it doesn't work. You have to deposit at very, very low, low deposition rate, maybe 0 0.1 angstrom a second or so. Yeah. So this is the dry salt. Is this you end up with dry salmonide all the way through? Yes. Yeah. There's no tungsten. Because the film is uh, the film is less less than a nanometer thick. Yeah, it gets converted all up. You have to, if you are, if you suppose you want to make a thicker film, or you want to selenize a 10 nanometer thick tungsten film, then you have to change your recipe. Put a little bit extra selenium in the so in, in, the, in the reactor, wood for a slightly longer time. So for each one, you have to fine tune your recipe to get the right. Yeah. How do you control the and uh, what would be the like, uh, size? Okay, so PLD, uh, let me come back to that. Okay, here. Yeah. So in our case, our targets is a six target carousel and each target is one inch in diameter, okay? And now it's a good question, how do you come down to this energy, right? Because this laser, if you fire an external laser at 1800, at 18 kilovolts, so you still get a lot of energy. So how do you cut it down? So you have to put attenuators in the path. So that's what we do, cut down the energy density. And, and again, the important thing is this distance is very critical. So, yeah. Yeah. Yes. 
I actually didn't get it. Why is the uh, distance more important? You said some target material will get thousand dollar. Yeah, see, when you are when you are ablating a target, uh, if your energy density is uh, too high, then a lot of stuff comes from the target, right? You get, uh, you suppose you are using tungsten diselenide. You may get atoms of tungsten and selenium. You may also get tungsten diselenide molecule, but you also get chunks of material coming from the target. So all that goes moving forward with a certain velocity towards your substrate. Now, if you keep the distance large, the heavy particles simply fall down. They don't reach, okay? And also, if you create high gas pressure here, you put some neutral gas, argon, for example, then the mean free path of the atoms which are coming from the target is very short now. So the heavy particles fall down and you get a nice smooth film. So again, as I said, it's more of an art. You have to fine tune these things to get a uniform thing. Yes. Uh, Theoretical simulations find the best parameters for the CVD gap of the tools, or just find some. I mean, you find the best. Well, no, we have not gone that far yet. So far, it has been only trial and error. But you are right, particularly for CVD, in the CVD reactor, MOCVD reactor or CVD, you should do simulations of the gas flow. That's very important. That's one thing. And you can control you know, other processes also. For example, when you are doing PLD, the material which is coming out of the target, the plume, right, which has a bright color because your energy is very high, and the, the atoms or molecules which are coming out are ionized, so you are emitting light. And you can probe that, uh, you can probe that, uh, that plume with a spectrometer and see what kind of species you have in your plasma. That also is a control parameter. But we have not done all that, yeah. But it can be done. I think, I think UMD does that. You had some, you had at one, yeah, yeah, in the past, yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So next speaker. Yes.